Okay, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today to, for this uh, JSGS uh, public lecture. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome David Welch uh, here. So first of all, just a, a word if you're not familiar with uh, Johnson Shoyama. It's a graduate school of uh, public policy, a provincial, study, a provincial center for advanced study and research in uh, public policy and administration. And there's a campus here in, at the University of Saskatchewan and one at the University of Regina. You can see uh, people on the screen there. So welcome to uh, everyone at the University of Regina. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that uh, today's event is taking place on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 uh, territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Uh, my name is Karen Holroyd and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Political Studies here at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce David Welch uh, to you today, who's going to be speaking about uh, the role of nationalism in maritime and uh, territorial disputes. So uh, David, as well as being, uh, as being a good friend, was my colleague at the University of Waterloo. Um, he's a professor of political studies at the University of Waterloo and also the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs uh, in Waterloo and also a senior fellow at CG or the Centre for International Governance Innovation there. And he works uh, primarily on uh, security, particularly uh, Asia-Pacific security. Uh, David has won all kinds of awards for teaching for a number of his, uh, a number of his books, including uh, Justice and the Genesis of War and uh, Painful Choices, A Theory of Foreign Policy Change. He's written lots and lots of, uh, of articles and books, a couple of ones that uh, I think are of, uh, might be also of particular interest. Uh, he worked on a, uh, wrote a book and worked on the documentary on, um, called Virtual JFK, Vietnam if Kennedy Had Lived. And he also has done a lot of work on the Cuban Missile Crisis and basically interviewing people who were there at the time that the Cuban Missile Crisis took place uh, about what the Cubans were thinking, what the Russians were thinking, what the Americans were thinking at that, uh, at that time. And they've done a really fascinating documentary that, uh, that looks at that, uh, in, case you're, uh, in case you're interested. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome David. I'm very uh, grateful that he's come. And uh, he's going to be speaking about uh, the role of nationalism in mar maritime and territorial disputes. So please help me, uh, join me in welcoming David Welch. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for that um, effusive introduction. Uh, you've shaped expectations so high that now I'm going to disappoint everybody. But anyway, so it goes. Karen said, I have a very strong interest in international security issues, and these days most of the action is in East Asia. That's the part of the world that keeps me awake at night, uh, primarily because there are at least four places in East Asia uh, where uh, potential conflicts could erupt, and on each of those four, Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, and South China Sea, there's at least one nuclear-armed country on either side of the issue. Uh, so this is a part of the world that I think we repays careful attention. It's very important to understand what's going on there and why. If you want to avoid conflict, you really can't avoid trying to figure out what it is that people want, need, fear, and believe, and try to find the opportunities for reducing the misperceptions, the misjudgments, and the misunderstandings. Now, of those four places I mentioned as potential flashpoints, uh, two of them primarily involve uh, disputes over maritime jurisdiction, and territorial sovereignty. And particularly, they concern very small islands and rocks, uh, which is one of the interesting things. And I want to talk about uh, the role particularly nationalism plays in those kinds of disputes and how nationalism can make things particularly dangerous. But let's start with a pop quiz, and I'll be impressed if anybody has any answers to it. Does anybody recognize these and can tell me what they are? No takers. Yeah? Almost. Good guess. Well, these are the Senkaku Islands, otherwise known in China as the Yaoyu Islands. And they're small islands claimed by Japan, China, and Taiwan. They're not far from Taiwan. They're administered by Japan. Uh, they were annexed by Japan in 1895, and the Japanese have considered them Japanese territory ever since. The Chinese used to consider them Chinese territory, kind of forgot about them for a very long time, but in 1978 started to reassert a traditional claim. How about these? Anybody know what these are? Uh, 
shy. <laughs> These are Dr. Dr. Keshwa. All right, so they look quite similar. Uh, claimed both by Japan and by South Korea. Uh, Japan, again, formally annexed these in 1905, and uh, they're controlled today by Korea, South Korea. And in fact, the South Koreans feel so intently about asserting their claim to these islands, or rocks, uh, that the South Koreans actually pay an elderly couple to live there full time. And they even built a cell phone tower so that they could claim to have functional jurisdiction over these islands. Uh, this couple's getting on in age, and I wonder how long they're going to want to stick there. But uh, in any case, it's one of the big irritants in relations between Japan and South Korea. How about these? Anybody recognize these? These are what the Japanese call the Northern Territories, and what the Russians call the Southern Kuril Islands. And they are claimed by Japan, occupied by Russia. In fact, they were occupied by the Soviet Union in the waning days of the Second World War. And uh, there are, as they say, four islands under dispute, uh, two big ones, one small one, and a bunch of rocks. For some reason, they'll always refer to these as four islands, when in fact it's a whole bunch. But anyway, never mind, <laughs> not important. Uh, it is a continuing sticking point in Japanese-Russian relations, and as a result, primarily of this now, there's still no peace treaty, formally ending the Second World War between Japan and Russia. How about this? Anyone recognize this one? See, isn't this great? These things are so small and insignificant. This is Mischief Reef. This is an island that China has built in the South China Sea. And in its natural condition, Mischief Reef was entirely underwater 24-7. In other words, it wasn't even an island. It wasn't even a rock. It was a submerged reef. And the Chinese dredged a whole lot of sand and coral, destroying a whole lot of coral illegally, uh, built a large artificial island, supplied it with a nice long airstrip, pre-positioning anti-aircraft facilities here, uh, basically putting military infrastructure on this, uh, what used to be a reef, uh, in what is, now we know, the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. So interestingly, China has built the Philippines an artificial island, and I'm waiting for the handover ceremony. Uh, I'll probably be waiting a very, very long time. How about this one? Surprise. This is Hans Island. Anybody ever heard of Hans Island? Yeah, what is it? Uh, it's a, a small island between uh, like Greenland kind of territory and the end of it. It's really, really far north and it's not really habitable, but yeah. they kind of keep this for the uh, like bottle of the That's stuff. right. Yeah, this is right smack in the middle of the strait between Greenland and Rivet and um, Denmark, of course, formally had sovereignty over Greenland. When, Greenland. when Denmark and Canada delineated the boundary between the two countries right down through the strait, they kind of forgot to take this into account. And so the boundary sort of went right through it. But then the question arose, well, who actually controls this particular rock? And both <laughs> countries claim it. And um, it's a source of mirth rather than tension between Canada and Denmark. Um, sort of this kabuki that happens that you mentioned, the bottle of diplomacy. Roughly once a year, Canada sends troops to this island, plant a Canadian flag, and leave a bottle of Canada Club whiskey, whiskey, Canadian Club whiskey. And then the Danes will send troops a little bit later, and they'll replace the Canadian flag with the Danish flag, drink the whiskey, and leave a bottle of schnapps. Next year, the cycle continues. Hasn't really had any effect on Danish-Canadian relations. How about this one? Aren't these great? I love these <laughs> useless islands. Uh, this is Machias Seal Island, and this is claimed both by Canada and the United States. Bet you didn't know we had a territorial dispute with the United States. 
this is it. It's an island in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, there's a lighthouse on it, which is occupied and operated by Canada. Uh, but the Americans still formally claim it. The reason there's a dispute is when Canada and the United States settled the maritime boundary in the Gulf of Maine, they didn't bother clarifying the status of certain rocks that were very close to the coast. So the, the seaward boundary was very clear, but the boundary right around here is not clear. Uh, this is actually sort of an important, semi-important uh, dispute because... There's a rich fishery, a lobster fishery in particular, right around here. And both Canadians and Americans uh, harvest lobster off this island. There's kind of a modus vivendi now. But uh, potentially, at least, you know, if either country wanted to push it, they could try to exclude the other country's fishers from uh, operating in the waters nearby. They could try to, as they say. It's not clear if they would succeed as a matter of international law. But anyway... Yeah, we have a maritime, uh, we have a territory dispute with the United States. Uh, more hotly disputed. You're not going to recognize that, are you? <laughs> uh, that's the South China Sea. Looks just like every other patch of water anywhere on the planet. Uh, but in the South China Sea, there are significant disputes over maritime jurisdiction. Who has exclusive rights to do what? Um, drill for oil, um, pump gas, fish very hotly contested area. So these are all active disputes, and some of them, I want to suggest, are potentially dangerous, and some are not. And so the question is, why? what makes something dangerous? And what makes dispute benign? Just to go through some of these, I'll give you sort of my rough read on what is actually going on. We'll start with the Senkaku, Diaoyu Islands dispute, which is disputed between Japan and China. And um, for each of these disputes, I like to try to think, why do people care? So why does Japan care about the Senkaku and Diaoyu Islands? Now, the standard story you'll hear in the realist literature in international politics is territory disputes are really all about power-relevant resources. So about uh, strategic advantage or about economic resources and that kind of thing. Uh, my view, the Chinese don't really care about these islands for what we would call tangible reasons, such as uh, strategy or economics. They're economically worthless, except for the fishery around them. Um, but then the, there's a fisheries deal with China, so Japan actually allows the Taiwanese to fish around them anyway. Um, it's, they're not strategically useful. You can't really do anything with them militarily. It's of any consequence. Uh, milieu goals are... Uh, I would describe as uh, what's, what are the features of the international order that are at stake in a dispute? And again, I don't think the Japanese tend to think that the dispute has much impact uh, on the, the nature of international order in East Asia. But the really important thing is the intangible, and that's the symbolic value of these islands. And for Japan, they have become sort of the lightning rod for suspicions about Chinese intentions toward Japan in particular, but in the region in general. And the fact that the Chinese have been ramping up more assertively their claim to these rocks uh, signals to the Japanese that China is a serious long-term threat. And if China you know, bends on this one, it's a matter of time before the Chinese claim Okinawa, and then it's a matter of time before the Chinese try to reduce Japan to a vassal state entirely. Uh, what are the Chinese up to? Again, I don't think Chinese think of these things as terribly relevant in terms of international order. Uh, a little bit more important, I would say, to China than Japan in terms of tangible, tangible resources because China actually is running out of productive fishing grounds. But again, just like the Japanese, this is primarily, in my view, about the symbolism. And here the Chinese perspective is Japan stole these from us in 1895 and has never returned them as they ought to do. And so it's all about the historical grievance of China's uh, humiliation at the hands of the Japanese in the late 19th century. Good same thing with Dokdo Takeshima, again, from the Japanese perspective. These are really not very important. 
politically or economically. Um, they're dramatically important, really significantly important in terms of the local milieu because if, the, if this dispute were solved, Japan and South Korea could cooperate much more easily and much more effectively on a range of issues, including security issues. Uh, but this is an obstacle to enhanced Japanese-South Korean uh, cooperation. And there are two countries that have very strongly overlapping strategic interests. They're both liberal democracies. They're both allies of the United States. They're both suspicious of Chinese expansionism, as they call it. Um, they're both threatened by North Korea. There's a lot that these two countries could do cooperatively to each other's benefit if they could clear certain obstacles from their relationship. So that's really important. Symbolically, again, it, it, because Korea presses its claim so strongly against Japan, it gets Japanese backs up. And so most Japanese who ordinarily wouldn't really care about this dispute start caring about it when South Korea won't shut up about it. And goes on and on and on, sort of amplifies it. Uh, so it's definitely a strong irritant, and, and that has provoked a kind of defensive belligerence on the part of the Japanese. For South Korea, again, the islands are pretty useless. They don't really seem to think or care all that much about the effect this dispute has on their broader international security environment, but hugely symbolically important. And from the Korean perspective, the mere fact that Japan claims these rocks as their own indicates that they're unrepentant for their imperial history. It's basically, to the South Korean mind, an indication that Japan has never reconciled to losing control over the Korean Peninsula. Very strongly held belief in many quarters in Korea. Uh, it's actually a misperception. The Japanese don't see this dispute as having anything to do with their history in Korea. They see it as an unrelated, run-of-the-mill territory dispute. And in fact, uh, the Japanese government, they will not tell you this publicly, but they will tell me this privately, and have done many times, right, the Japanese would love to lose these islands at the International Court of Justice. And they've told Korea three times, look, you want to settle this? Go to The Hague. You know, file a case. Make your argument. We'll reply to it. And then the judges will decide. And Japan is perfectly happy to lose these islands in a legal setting. Uh, it clears the obstacle to improved relations with South Korea, and then they get to turn around and say to the Chinese, look at how adults solve territory disputes. <clears throat> Um, anyway, South Korea refuses to go to The Hague to get this settled. Their view is, look, we already control them. Why should we risk losing them? I think that's something they shouldn't worry about because in an actual court case, South Korea would win for reasons I have to talk about later if you like. Northern territories, southern Korea is, uh, again, kind of similar, not terribly important strategically or economically. Um, no big impact on regional security order, but symbolically, uh, the Japanese are very exercised about Russian refusal, refusal to hand these back to Japan, uh, and it's a sign, they say, of a general Russian disposition to be hostile to Japan. Uh, and that's an old historical grievance that goes back into the 19th century, and of course it peaked around the time of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. For Russia, again, not really significant in terms of the grand strategic environment, uh, not economically or strategically valuable. Um, it is there symbolically important. And uh, uh, the Japanese, it's fair to say, care more than the Russians, but the Russians are, have never been in a mood to be terribly flexible on this issue and just hand them back to Japan. Um, now, the South China Sea is the most complicated of all of these East Asian territory disputes. And if you haven't been following it, to give you a rough, brief overview of what's been going on, uh, South China Sea, as you can tell, is bordered by a number of countries. And seven different countries claim something or other in the South China Sea. Uh, 
in an overlapping claim with somebody else at least one. So for example, up here in the northern part of the South China Sea are the Paracel Islands. They're claimed by Vietnam and China. And in fact, in 1973, there was a short, sharp military action during which China actually kicked the Vietnamese off some of these islands. And so China controls them entirely. Uh, but all of these islands up there are currently under dispute, claimed also by Vietnam. In the south part of the sea, there's a variety of features. Features is the relevant word here claimed by a number of different countries. We collectively call these things the Spratly Islands. For the most part, they're just rocks. They're not islands under international law. We know that now, thanks to the Philippines Arbitration Tribunal ruling, which I can talk about a bit later. Um, but in any case, some of these are occupied by China, some by the Philippines, some by Vietnam. And uh, China, in fact, occupies a minority of these features, and they occupy the least good quality features. So the Chinese artificial island building campaign has been entirely in this area, and the idea has been to bolster China's physical presence in the region, as well as send a signal about the seriousness of their claim. This is Scarborough Shoal. That's disputed as between the Philippines and China. It has uh, been traditionally recently controlled by China, and that's really still the case, although China has been letting Philippine fishers uh, operate in the waters since the tribunal ruling two years ago. Now, this thing here is the so-called famous nine-dash line. And that was something that the um, nationalist government in China promulgated to define the nature of its claims in the South China Sea. And Taiwan still claims everything inside this line. When asked to clarify what the line means, Taiwan has said it just means we claim all the features inside. It doesn't mean we claim that the waters here are internal Chinese waters that are subject entirely to Chinese jurisdiction. When they say China, they mean us. Taiwan actually only controls one of these, Itu Ava. It just so happens to be the best one. So China's got the biggest and most functional rock uh, in its natural condition. Now, PRC, Beijing, just inherited the nationalist claim to the South China Sea and continued to use this nine-dash line to define it. China, mainland China, is ambiguous about what that actually means. They've never actually said, as Taiwan did, it just means we claim the features inside it. The neighbors have all suspected that what China really means is this is all internal Chinese waterway, and that China has exclusive right to exercise jurisdiction about who does what, who goes where, who exploits what resources inside the South China Sea. And it was China's intransigence on that and its behavior in the Scarborough Shoal, its activities in Mischief Reef and various other features claimed by the Philippines that prompted the Philippines to go to the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague and file a claim under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, asking the tribunal to clarify the legal status of the Nine-Dash Line and the maritime rights attached to these various features down here and here. And the uh, Philippines was very careful not to ask the tribunal to rule on territorial sovereignty because the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea doesn't have anything to say about territorial sovereignty. It's only about maritime rights. <clears throat> so that was a very clever ploy, and uh, the Philippines won that case. Uh, it was a slam dunk. They won on every single point except one minor one. Uh, with the result... Most interestingly, that the nine-dash line has no status under international law and that there are no islands in the South China Sea. Uh, for the purposes of the UN Convention, none of these is an island. They are only rocks, low tide elevations, or reefs. And that's important because under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, only an island gets 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And to be an island, 
It has to be above water at high tide and capable of sustaining human habitation. A lot of these things are above water at high tide, but the um, arbitration tribunal ruled that none of them in their natural condition is capable of sustaining human habitation because they don't have the necessary fresh water supplies, um, they're not arable, and in addition, they've never actually been used as um, permanent places of residence by any of the countries in the region. Historically, all that's ever happened is that people who were fishing from various claimant countries would, during the fishing season, go and set up camp there and use them as a local base for fishing operations and then go back home. They never brought their families. They never brought their dogs. They never set up chicken coops, the kinds of things you would do if you were actually going to be living there. So the arbitration tribunal did everybody a favor in an interesting way by basically saying you can't draw exclusive economic zones around any of these things. All you can do is draw exclusive economic zones from the coastlines of the claimant countries. And that's these, these blue dashed lines. These are the exclusive economic zone claims the different countries have. And that's good news because... While some of these are rocks under the UN Convention entitled to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, if you sum up the total surface area that's covered by a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, it comes to about 2.5% of the total surface area of the South China Sea. So big deal, who cares? Whereas if these things had been islands under international law, then 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones would basically mean most of the South China Sea was in dispute for purposes of economic uh, jurisdiction. So, you know, back to Mischief Reef. This was, in its natural condition, they said a reef, which means under uh, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, as clarified by the Arbitration Tribunal ruling, this gets no rights. If nothing is even above water at high tide, you cannot claim it. Well, not a mile territorial sea, you can't claim uh, customs enforcement contiguous zone of 24 nautical miles, and you definitely cannot claim um, 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And the UN Convention is also really clear, it says you can't build an island and acquire maritime rights. So an artificial island gets you nothing. Um, so, very helpful decision. China rejected it and railed against it. They argued that the had the jurisdiction, the um, tribunal had no jurisdiction, that uh, its findings were null and void. The official Chinese position is we completely reject entirely what the tribunal said in 2016. In fact, they've quietly been complying, and they have not publicized this because they're very smart. If they publicized their compliance with the ruling, they would basically be telling their own nationalist domestic audience that they caved. And you can't be the Communist Party of China and publicly cave on a, what people see as a core sovereignty kind of issue. So Beijing's been walking this narrow line between pretending to reject the tribunal's ruling and actually complying with it, hoping the domestic audience doesn't notice that but also hoping that the international audience does notice. Uh, and that latter one has proven problematic. If, if you read the newspapers today, you'll still always um, encounter the view that China has just rejected and is not respecting the tribunal ruling. Now, the South China Sea is terribly important uh, for a wide variety, variety of reasons. So whereas I said those other islands, the Senkakus and Dr. Takeshima, Northern Territory, is not terribly economically or strategically important. South China Sea is terribly economically and strategically important. And so this, side, this slide gives you a sense of the uh, importance of the South China Sea as a shipping route. About a third of the world's global trade, seaborne trade by value, goes through the South China Sea every year. So it's incredibly important for that. Um, particularly important for China, 
It's got the biggest economic stake in freedom of navigation through the South China Sea uh, because all of China's good quality oil facilities are on the South China Sea coast up there, and China depends heavily upon the free flow of oil, particularly from the Persian Gulf through the South China Sea. South Korea and Japan and so on also import a lot of oil through the South China Sea, but they have alternative routes. So if, if this were closed, uh, you could get shipping to go around. Not so for China. If China's going to get oil from the Middle East, they need to have super tankers coming through the South China Sea one way or another. So ironically, the country that has the biggest interest in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is, in fact, China. And when you read the newspaper talking about China's desire to interdict freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, be very, very skeptical. So again, finally, just on this particular dispute, there are seven different claimants. I won't talk about them all. But with respect to China, China sees the South China Sea as terribly important for all kinds of reasons. Uh, strategically and economically important, symbolically important because China, the regime's legitimacy depends upon it being seen um, upholding and defending core interests such as sovereignty against hostile claimants. And for China, it's very important that the South China Sea not be a source of major instability, regional instability. So China is terribly important in all three dimensions. Uh, Vietnam, as I said, another claimant, also very heavily dependent upon access to the South China Sea for economic reasons primarily. Um, very concerned about the implications of these disputes for the security environment, and in particular China's possible hegemonic ambitions in the area. And uh, symbolically, of course, the Vietnamese and the Chinese have a rocky relationship. This is just one of the issues on which Vietnam and China um, butt heads from time to time. But it's, in my view, really just more important for Vietnam for these other two reasons. Philippines, a very similar story with Vietnam. Probably more important because so many people in the Philippines depend upon access to the fishing grounds that China had been restricting. Um, terribly important for the security environment in general and the rules of the road. Um, less of a symbolic issue for the Philippines. They don't have a long-standing historical rivalry of any kind with China, so that's um, not as significant. The United States is not a claimant in the South China Sea. Uh, however, they care a lot, and they care primarily about the rules of the road and what the dispute uh, what effect the dispute is going to have on uh, a rule-based international order. So the United States is active in the region, sails ships, flies airplanes through on a regular basis to try to signal their refusal to recognize that any country has any right to claim control over shipping or claim the right to control non-hostile military activities such as overflights and reconnaissance missions. Um, it is a very strategically important part of the world for the United States as well, though it doesn't depend upon uh, shipping through the South China Sea anywhere near as the local countries do. Uh, China and the United States don't really have, haven't had any significant historical uh, national ego conflicts, so that the symbolism of the dispute has not really been that important in the past. This may be changing. I think over time, and especially under the Trump administration, sort of the symbolic and tangible importance of the South China Sea to the United States will probably rise, has probably been rising. So I want to suggest that if we want to understand why some of these disputes are dangerous and others are less dangerous, it's important to look at the interplay between four different things. Uh, between the history of territorial maritime disputes, the politics associated with them, and mediating those two things, human psychology and international law. So for example, if we look at the South China Sea, uh, all disputes begin with competing stories about history. And all of the claimants to the South China Sea 
basically say history proves that this was Chinese or Philippine or Vietnamese territory, so forth and so on. Don't believe a word of it. It's all terribly unclear. You can go back as far as you like in history, and you'll never be able to find any convincing evidence that any of the current claimants has any long-standing good claim to control over anything. In any case, history is really only relevant in legal argument, and it's not relevant in negotiation. So if you're going to dispute the history of something, um, you only really gain from that effort if you're willing to engage in a legal adjudication process. Now, the Chinese have always said to the other claimants, look, we'll just negotiate bilateral on disputes. We'll settle disputes through bilateral negotiation. And when they do meet bilaterally and talk about disputes, the Chinese position always is, uh, you do what we say and we'll be nice to you. So that's the nature of the Chinese deal. And that means everybody else acknowledges Chinese sovereignty over everything. Um, Chinese think that's a reasonable deal. The others don't. So there's no negotiation route to solving these maritime and territorial disputes, which means history is irrelevant uh, in bilateral negotiation. It's only through law that you're going to make your historical arguments and hope they have legal force. <clears throat> now, for the territorial disputes, in other words, who's entitled to exercise sovereignty over what, uh, you have to appeal to a variety of things, including history. That's one of the arguments you make. If you can show that historically you've had, you've exercised jurisdiction, you've occupied something, uh, others have acknowledged that it's yours through treaties or through other forms of recognition, that makes your case very strong. So there's a variety of different kinds of public international law considerations in addition to just the historical narrative you can um, present that would enable a court or a tribunal to decide who enjoys territorial sovereignty. If your dispute is over maritime jurisdiction, there's only one place to look, and that's the UN Convention. That's because the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea specifically says, right near the beginning, this convention supersedes all prior conventions and principles of customary international law when determining maritime jurisdiction. And so this is where the Philippines, as I said, was very clever and went to The Hague to make their claims, make, make, pitch their questions to the tribunal about maritime jurisdiction strictly under the framework of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And um, I should have pointed out This is actually the Philippines legal team arguing their case in front of the tribunal in The Hague. And this is the Chinese legal team. Uh, China boycotted. They refused to send anybody to contest the case. Uh, partly, as it turned out, I later discovered because China had realized the Philippines had signed up all the really good international lawyers. So the Philippines brought the A team. And China didn't want to bring the B team. <coughs> they decided, we'll just boycott. Uh, China made the mistake of being really elaborate in explaining why it was boycotting. And so what the tribunal did was it took the Chinese statement of objection to the case as the Chinese position on the dispute. And took it very seriously. And they quite fairly tried to give the best possible reading of the Chinese objections uh, and then use those as part of the basis of their decision. So the Chinese probably would have been better if they hadn't been so explicit about why they were objecting to this. Never mind. Um, as I said, the UN Convention governs maritime rights. It's terribly complicated. And so it's not surprising that there was ambiguity and confusion. I won't bother you with all the details, but you know, the law of the sea um, specifies things like continental shelf rights, Exclusive economic zone, what you're allowed to do or not do in that 200 nautical mile area. Uh, your territorial sea, contiguous zone is an area that extends out where you can do things like hot pursuit 
for customs enforcement or law enforcement, really very specific kind of thing. And um, the Philippines basically said, all right, what of these apply to the various different features in the South China Sea? The tribunal cleared a lot of that up, but there's one remaining ambiguity that nobody has asked any tribunal to rule on, and that's the question of, can states object to other countries' military activities in the exclusive economic zone? China says yes, and China is one of 23 countries that say yes. The other important one is Brazil. Uh, the American position and everybody else's position is no. Any country can do whatever they want with their military forces in an EEZ. Uh, they can't do it in the territorial sea. The UN Convention is clear on that. But fair game in the EEZ. And that's important because it's that disagreement that has in the past led to actual encounters between American and Chinese military forces. For example, the Hainan Island P3 incident in 2002 was the result of an American reconnaissance plane operating in the EEZ off Hainan Island monitoring Chinese submarine base activities, being harassed, intercepted and harassed by a Chinese fighter pilot who was trying to chase them away, and in the course of chasing them away, clipped their wing. And the Chinese pilot crashed and died, and the American spy plane was crippled and had to make an emergency landing on Hainan Island where the Chinese um, took their time picking it apart and examining it and all the rest of it. Uh, but that encounter would not have happened if the two countries had agreed on the question of whether it's okay for the U.S. military to operate reconnaissance missions in an EEZ. And that ambiguity continues. The Americans, by the way, are right, and the Chinese are wrong on that point. The text is really clear, but China doesn't want it to be clear because they feel very vulnerable to American reconnaissance off their coast, and uh, they worry that it gives the Americans a huge advantage if they are allowed to operate so close to their shores. So the law, of course, is terribly important. Uh, politics, too, obviously, as I said, countries involved have their domestic politics to contend with. In the Chinese case, the imperative there is don't look like you've caved. Don't look like you've given up any inch of sovereignty. And the international politics is also terribly important. So the complicated game for all of the claimant countries to manage the domestic politics of these disputes and the international politics of these disputes. Now I said that psychology is also relevant. Uh, and uh, let me explain why. Anybody know this? <laughs> This is the best thing ever done for television. This is Pride and Prejudice. It's a six-part BBC production. What does Pride and Prejudice have to do with uh, maritime and territory dispute? Well, exactly this. Scheme of theory. Uh, it's well established in psychology that we all form beliefs really easily. So when you get ambiguous information about the world and you don't know what it means, you're very eager to try to fit it into your belief system. And so you'll adopt beliefs really easily on the basis of little information. But once you've developed a belief, you will hang on to it, you will defend it, and you will resist changing it. So there's a double standard between the amount of information you need to form a belief and the amount of information you need to change it. And that's what's going on in Pride and Prejudice. So Elizabeth Bennett meets Mr. Darcy early in the novel at one ball, and on the basis of about 20 seconds worth of interaction, she decides he's a flaming jerk. <coughs> and it takes an entire novel for her to change her mind and decide that he's not, in fact, a flaming jerk. So the amount of information required for that change was that much. The amount of form the belief was that much. This is what happens in territory disputes. So why do the people in China think that the South China Sea is Chinese? Well, their government told them that. And they told them that about 20 or 30 years ago for the first time. And they believed it. And the textbooks started to repeat it, as a matter of fact. So pretty much every man, woman, and child in China really does sincerely believe that the Spratly Islands are and always have been Chinese territory. How do you get them to change that? It's going to take a long, long time for them to understand that the history is unclear, and that 
the law doesn't really support that fairly well either. Um, that's why it's a, a difficult thing for the Chinese government to manage on the domestic politics side. Another reason that these disputes tend to be more intractable than they should be is uh, the fundamental attribution error. Every time somebody you dislike does something you dislike, you tend to think that reflects who they are, reflects on their character. But if somebody you like does something you dislike, your initial intended reaction is to say, oh, they had no choice, like circumstances made it necessary for them to do that. So you'll forgive people you like doing things you don't like, but you'll infer from people you dislike doing things that you dislike that they're bad people. And in addition to being bad people, you'll think that what they do that you don't like is generally targeted at you. Perfectly normal, the egocentric bias. And these territory and maritime disputes trigger the justice motive. Uh, the idea that somebody else is claiming as theirs something that you honestly think yours is yours by right generates really quite powerful emotion. And it's an emotional response that increases in intransigence and stridency. It makes you more willing to take risks. It makes you less sensitive to um, offers of side payments to solve disputes. Uh, it makes these kinds of things less manageable, less tractable, and much, much more dangerous. Now, stepping back and looking at all of these disputes that I've mentioned here today, uh, in one paper I did, I went and I coded, who cares about what, with what degree of intensity and why? And I won't walk you through this, it would take too long. But the bottom line here is that it's this, these two rows are the rows in which nationalism is operating. And it's symbolic and ideational value of the dispute uh, will affect its intensity depending upon how much nationalist grievance is represented in the dispute or how much the dispute stands as a proxy for a nationalist identity grievance, and how much it activates the justice mode. Those two things together. And if you poured over this with enough time, you'd notice that some of these disputes are dangerous and some aren't. And I took all of those different disputes and all of the claimants, and I kind of ran them through this heuristic. If you look at the actual strategic or economic value of something, and then its symbolic or ideational value, how much the justice motive is triggered by it, and whether the dispute is politically salient domestically or not, um, eventually you'll arrive at some assessment of whether this dispute is not really terribly dangerous, it's not likely to lead to a militarized conflict, or it is dangerous, that it might, might very possibly result in a militarized conflict. And the only pathways that end up here are the ones that go through politically salient, justice motive, and significant symbolic or ideational value. Um, I think that's an, a significant finding. You can even get to a danger of militarized conflict where there's no significant strategic and economic value. So the realists are wrong. Politics is not about interest defined in terms of power. It's more significantly about interest defined in terms of self-respect, national rivalry, sense of justice, uh, underappreciated um, emotional dimensions of international politics. Uh, just to end on the question of, well, how do you fix all this? These disputes tend to begin with, <clears throat> as I said, disputes about history. <laughs> and in this series of Slides I'm going to show you now. Uh, red means angry and blue means calm. So you get historical disputes. Sometimes they're really intense. Sometimes they're not. You know, Canada and Denmark, nice calm history dispute over Hans Island. Uh, but in many of these cases, especially in East Asia, these disputes tend to be very hot, very emotional. These feed through the psychological dynamics I was talking about, interact with domestic politics. Feedback loop can be amplifying. 
You have to break this somehow. And the way you break it is by trying to shift the conversation from history to law. And the more you can get people to focus on the legal um, issues, the legal principles involved in the dispute, um, the more people tend to calm down about the history and the more focused they become on the importance of law. And once people start talking about disputes through a legal frame, they're quickly on, or much more likely to be on the same page. And when you're on the same page, there's less scope for misjudgment, misperception, and, um, and uh, anger. And so shifting the conversation to law over the long run, ideally, will calm the psychological dynamics and in turn calm the political dynamics. So it's good news that the Philippines Arbitration Tribunal made such a clear ruling in 2016. We're already starting to see that it's having a positive effect on the dispute to the extent that China has kind of backed off for the most part. Um, Playing nice. The other countries haven't noticed this yet. That's unfortunate, but given enough time with luck, they will notice it. And then in the long run, we'll see some kind of agreed framework for settling the nature of the territory and maritime disputes there. In the Canadian Arctic, Hans Island, and Makaya Seal Island, we're kind of already here. Nobody really much cares about the history in those disputes, and they don't activate nationalist grievances. So they're more humorous than consequential. And it would be great if all territory and maritime disputes were humorous and not consequential, but that's not the case yet in East Asia. I will stop there. Happy to answer questions or field comments.